Well, good evening. Certainly hope you were able to tune in and have no problem getting our live stream up tonight. This is still a little different for us as we're uh, approaching now a few weeks here. We've been doing our, our Wednesday night a couple of times here on live stream. And I know uh, several of you have, have appreciated the fact that we've been able to have this technology. And we do have a few of our folks who are not able to, to get this. And uh, we want to encourage them as well and certainly try to uh, keep an eye on them. They enjoyed our drive-in service, especially those that were not able to get live stream. But I think about uh, probably 90% of our congregation has that ability, so we're certainly thankful for that. And tonight, we want to take some time. We're going to study God's Word, and we do uh, uh, want to have a little bit of prayer time. We, of course, are not having our typical prayer meeting, and that really is a challenge for us because the prayer meeting is one of the most important services of the week. I hope it's not that we're not praying as a church. I hope we are doing that. And we're sort of approaching this service by service. So every service we have to uh, just kind of look to the next one. And so it appears now just from uh, the sentiment that's out there that this uh, separation is supposed to go to the end of the month. And so we'll keep an eye on that. I still don't want to make a call of what we're going to do. I mean, we're just going to take it week by week and see how it, how it plays out. But certainly um, the plan right now for Sunday which is the Sunday before Easter, we will uh, again have our drive-in service, that is our goal, and then we will also have live stream. If you're not able to be here for the drive-in service, then you may live stream it, and that's really just your call. I want everybody to be safe, be comfortable. Uh, We do want to uh, be a good testimony to the community. Um, If we can trust the Lord, and if this went on for indefinitely, eventually we just have to trust God to keep us safe, but if we can be a testimony at this point and use the live stream, then we want to keep doing that. But we want to have prayer tonight, and I'm going to have a prayer, and then we're going to look at uh, Exodus, and you can go to chapter 17 if you have your Bible, and we'll look at Exodus chapter 17. So let's have prayer. Lord, we thank you tonight that we can be here in this room. There's just a handful of us here uh, making this service take place, but many folks I trust are uh, listening online, and we could share the Word of God tonight and be helped. Or we can't really talk to each other, but we can pray for each other tonight and give us a unity of the Spirit in that sense. Lord, we do pray for the situation in our country. Certainly it is unique, and it's certainly a, a hardship on us and that we can't meet for church, but then a real hardship on folks who can't go to work, other folks are struggling, and then, of course, those that are sick. Lord, so far we've not seen widespread death spread from this virus, and we, though many have died, it's not been uh, widespread, but we pray that it would not even come close to the numbers that they're talking about that you'd stave that off and that we'd be able to give you glory for it. People would know that the God of heaven has protected us from it. And then we pray tonight for our folks. We pray for Ms. Blanton, that she continue to recover. We're thankful for her good uh, response from the surgery and that she continue to do better. Pray for Ms. Gunnels as she's lost her son. Lord, others have needs as well. We uh, just trust that you'd meet them. Help us now as we study your word in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been looking at the book of Exodus and... Of course, last week, the manna was provided for the children of Israel. They have just been now a few days out of the Red Sea. And, of course, they got three days out into the wilderness. The water was scarce. They began to murmur and complain. And you're going to see, and again in this chapter, it's the same thing, that the murmuring and the complaining of the children of Israel is certainly not a one-time occurrence. In fact, it's an ongoing occurrence. And, again, in this chapter, the water is scarce. There are just a week away from where they saw the Red Sea part. So certainly a short memory. But we go into this chapter and chapter and verse 1 of chapter 17. And you'll notice the Bible says, And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is it that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? For they be almost ready to stone me. Now the first thing I see in these verses, obviously, is the thirst of these people. And the thirst that they experienced obviously was no accident. God was able to get the attention of these people 
in a way that would be very simple, he calls them to thirst. Now, their thirst was a physical thirst. Their thirst would have really been an occasion for God to demonstrate who he is. You know, they had seen uh, the, the pouring out of the, or the parting of the Red Sea. They had seen the plagues fall on Egypt. They had seen God turn the Nile River into blood. I mean, we could talk about all of the different supernatural things they had seen. They had come to a, a place of water that, didn't, that was bitter, and they threw, it, threw a tree in the water, and it became sweet. Bread falls down now for some three or four days. It's been falling every day. They've been able to eat it. It's not just a matter of memory. The problem is they just do not look at the blessing of God and understand God's motive in keeping them safe. I mean, we read through this, and we see the heart of the children of Israel, and what this does is it, it brings out what we are really like on the inside. Now, we look at Israel, and we question, why can you not believe God could give you some water if he could part the Red Sea? Why would you think that God would not be able to give you some food if he can turn the Nile River into blood? I mean, why would they not expect God to do something wonderful? And yet, you know, often we forget blessings in our own life. I can remember times when we were in early ministry and we were dependent really from week to week on the Lord providing through God's people to take care of us. We were on love offerings and God did take care of us and we saw uh, our needs met, needs provided. But I can think of times of going to prayer with a specific prayer request, and I wouldn't even go over the numerous accounts, I'd have a specific prayer request, whether it was to meet a financial need, whether it was to be just an open up an area of ministry, and to be on my knees in prayer and have God answer that prayer before I could even get up from my knees. You get up from that and you think to yourself, God, I'll never doubt you again. I mean, I just saw a supernatural uh, provision of God here I have prayed, and God makes the telephone ring. I pray, and somebody knocks on the door or whatever it might be. God, I'll just, I'll just never doubt that you're going to take care of me again. I wish that was my testimony. I wish I could say I never doubted him again. But it doesn't take too long. Like the songwriter said, our hearts are prone to wonder. You get up in a tight spot a little bit after that, and you don't go to thinking back. You, you can talk yourself into believing anything about why that need was met You'll tell yourself it was a coincidence, but when God provides, our hearts are just like Israel. We have a tendency to forget. So you say, well, these people complained. They murmured. They didn't believe God. They weren't worthy of anything that he would shower on them. They were completely unworthy, and I echo that. Certainly, they didn't deserve anything from God, but you know what happens in the next several verses? God gives them water to drink. Now, why would God give them water when they don't deserve it? Well, that is the very definition of grace. You see, he's giving them what they do not deserve. They thirsted physically, had a physical need, and God is going to meet that need. You know, God reminds us, and this again is just a very practical thing. It's not even a, a deep spiritual truth beyond what's happening right here with the children of Israel. But God says, if I clothe the lily of the field, and they're arrayed like Solomon was never arrayed like the lily of a field. He said, if I'm able to clothe the lily of the field, if I'm able to give the, uh, the bird, the sparrow, his daily food, and he doesn't even have enough sense to do anything except what I've told him to do, and yet I provide food for him. He said, if I take care of nature, don't you know that you are of more value than many sparrows? Now, certainly that's true of the believer. But I believe it's even true of the, of the world. You know, even the lost world today, if they were honest, if they really sat up and took notice, they have a lot to be thankful for about the grace of God. You know, God says he reigns on the just and the unjust. That is, even the person who would blaspheme God, God gives him oxygen to breathe. I mean, even the person who says, I'm an atheist, I care nothing about the Bible, he still gives them a heart that, that pumps on its own. You know, we think about, and of course our minds are heavily on this disease that takes place, and you know, we look at this and say, isn't it awful that, uh, what, 800,000 people have, have acquired this disease and there's potential for more to get it, or thousands of people, of course, have died. But you know, I stop and think to myself, what if God, in His grace, did not give us immunity to disease? I mean, even lost people, 
drunkards, harlots, blasphemers, atheists, they still have an immune system. God in His grace gave them an immune system. You know, this is a fallen world. When the world fell, when Eve sinned, God said, okay, you brought sin into the world, now accept the consequences. Now we do accept the consequences of the fall. I mean, there are things, disease came as a result of the fall. Uh, you get sunburned because the fall came. I mean, all of these things that the fall of man, that sin came into the world, we do go through hardships, but do you know what God did? He graciously gave us remedies and things to protect us in the midst of our difficulties. God is a gracious God. So He is going to provide their physical need. Now let me take the, the message here because I think there's a deeper message than merely the fact that here's some murmuring, complaining people that God graciously provides for. There's a deeper truth that God's trying to teach us here. So not only do you see the, uh, the thirst of the people, but let's focus in for a moment on the provision of the Lord. Look, if you would, at verse 5. The Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee the elders of Israel, and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand, and go. And behold, I will stand before thee there upon a rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the chiding of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? You know, I see this rock that is smitten, and of course this is a well-known account, but he tells Moses to go and smite the rock with the rod that he smote the river with. This is the rod of God, the rod of power. He says, smite the rock, and water is going to come out of a rock. Now, you know that water does not naturally come out of a rock. God is doing something very supernatural here, something uh, highly unusual, something that the people had to recognize. Water doesn't typically come out of a rock, and God brought water forth out of a rock. But do you know 1 Corinthians 10 tells us specifically that this rock is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a type of Christ. Because do you know that this rock was there all the time? Had they stared at the rock, it wouldn't have helped them. They could have put it on a trailer and carried it around with them. It wouldn't have helped them. They could have had this rock available and lifted it up and worshipped it. That wasn't the idea. But when it was smitten by the power of God, it became a blessing to all the people. And let me tell you, Jesus, he was a great teacher, but you can listen to his teachings and not receive him, and they won't help you. Uh, he was a, a miracle worker, but if you're simply enamored by his miracles, that's not the point. But let me tell you, the Lord Jesus Christ, what made him a blessing to all and made him the gift of this world is when he was smitten. It is the blood that he shed that makes Jesus a blessing to this world. The smitten rock became a great blessing, and that's the significance. Do you know the Bible tells us in Isaiah 53, 4 about the Lord Jesus? Surely he hath borne our griefs, he has carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. It was the rod of God that laid the blow, that is, God put his own son on the cross and allowed him to be smitten for our sin, and thence the blessing comes to all people through his smiting. So I notice here the smitten rock, but then I notice a flowing stream. When he smote the rock, the stream began to flow. Now the rock was Christ. We know that from 1 Corinthians 10. You know what Jesus said in John chapter 7? Verse 37, on that last day, the great day of the feast, he stood and cried, If any man believe in me, out of his belly, as the scripture has said, shall flow rivers of living water. And it said in that passage, parenthetically, this he spake of the Spirit that was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Do you know when Jesus was smitten on the cross and made salvation possible, the rock is a picture of Jesus, and the river that came out of that rock is a picture of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit flowed to all that would accept Him that day. Now think about it now. Go beyond the simple truth that these people murmured and thirsted. Now they thirsted, and God provided them water. Well, let me tell you, Isaiah 40 verse 3 says, I will pour water upon him who is thirsty. Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. 
Now, I don't not murmur and complain. I don't come to God on a fleshly sense that the children of Israel did and murmur, God, why haven't you given me any water? But you know, if they'd have come to the, to the Lord in the right attitude, they would have said, God, you gave us water once. You corrected the water again. God, we're just waiting to see how you're going to provide it this time. Now, when we come to God in a spiritual thirst, we don't come and say, God, why don't I have power to win people to Christ? We don't say, God, why am I so lean in my spiritual walk? God, why do I continue to fail in this particular area? Don't be like the murmuring, complain spirit, but rather come and remind God that you're lean. God, I'm lean. How I need your power to reach people for Jesus. How I need your power to have a testimony. How I need your power today to be able to get these dirty habits out of my life. How I need your power to stay consistent in my prayer life. To come with that plea, I will pour water upon him who is thirsty. God is looking for the open, thirsty soul that is looking for help, and God will bring water out of the rock, and that's a picture of the Holy Spirit of God. So the rock was smitten. It flowed with water, and then there was a memorial name. Now, we read that in verse 7. It says, he called the place Masa. That word means temptation. And Meribah, that means chiding, because the chiding of the children of Israel. Now, you know, uh, he called the name of it. I assume that was Moses, but at least God did. God through Moses, or God called it, God named the place. Now, did you note that when he named this memorial, he didn't name it the, the water in the rock corner. He didn't name it God's provision uh, hangout. He named it to remind the people that they tempted him and chided with him. Because what these people needed to know, every time they were coming back through that area and they saw this place, what would remind them of the, of the provision of God was why God provided it. Because what that did is reminded them of who they were without the rock and without the water. What are we today without the rock and without the water? We're just a bunch of murmuring, complaining people, a zero with the ring rubbed out, that if God gave us what we deserve, we'd be in hell for all eternity. But because of the grace of God, he provided the rock, that's Jesus, his precious Holy Spirit to live inside of us, that's the water. And we are reminded that without him, we're just a bunch of murmuring, complaining nobodies. And so the rock was the provision of the Lord. But you know what happens next, very interesting, in verse 8, there's an attack from the enemy. It says then, now this it goes right into this verse. There's the rock is smitten, the water is provided, and then they're attacked by Amalek. Now, there's no mistakes in the Bible. God writes history in reverse. He uses literal events to predict future events. And so here you have the water, which is a picture of the Holy Spirit being poured out to the believer, and immediately they face an enemy. Now, not any enemy. You know, they didn't fight very many wars on this side of the River Jordan. They fought against Amalek. Forty years later, they're going to fight against uh, Sion and Og, and they're going to defeat them. That's the first battles before they enter into Canaan. But Amalek is unique. This is the first battle that Israel ever had to fight. And they fought against an enemy that evidently was very closely matched with them. Because what happens, you read on, it says, Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men, go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. It came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. When he let it down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Now, they were so closely matched in their battle that literally all Moses had to do when he raised his hands, and of course God's power took over, they began to get the edge. When, they, when he let down his hands, Amalek began to get the edge. Now, this uh, nation, Amalek, is going to fight with Israel over and over again. They're going to be a thorn into the side of Israel. And what Amalek is, is a picture of the flesh. Do you know Amalek is the grandchild, the man Amalek that produced the nation? He's the grandchild of Esau. 
You know, Esau in the New Testament was the profane one who sold his, uh, in the book of Genesis, sold his uh, birthright for a pot of lentils. That is, he was a man of the flesh, interested in the here and now. Here his descendant is a picture of the flesh, the constant enemy of the believer. You know when the flesh is going to show up? When God gave us the spirit. You see, before the flesh didn't fight you because you didn't have anybody to fight with him. But when you were saved, the God's Holy Spirit moved into you, gave you a new nature, and the flesh rebelled. The flesh says, I don't like anybody inside of me telling me I can't cuss. I don't like anybody inside of me telling me not to lust. I don't like anybody inside of me telling me I can't think dirty thoughts. I don't want anybody inside of me telling me that I'm not supposed to lose my temper. I don't want anybody inside of me to tell me to quit gossiping. See, the flesh rebels against the Holy Spirit of God because the Holy Spirit made you a new creature, changed you, made you new. Now, the old flesh can be defeated. It can be put down. When Moses rose his hand, Amalek didn't have any power, but when those hands went down, Amalek was alive and well. In fact, if you look down in verse 16, or in verse 14, the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in the book, in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Well, that's encouraging. He's going to put their remembrance out. Moses built an altar, called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. He said, Because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Now, he's going to wipe him out, but he says it's not going to be immediate. Because Israel, the Lord allowed the, uh, Amalek to continue to fight with them. And I'm going to tell you, the flesh one day is going to be wiped out. When Jesus comes and we get a new body, the flesh is done. The flesh is not going to be converted. The flesh is going to be eradicated. We're going to get a new body. And it's going to be our body that we'll have for all eternity. But, but in the meantime, living on this earth, we're going to have to have some struggles with the flesh. Several thoughts I'm going to look at briefly here about the fight with Amalek. Now, I noticed back in verse 9, there was participation. Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek. Now, Amalek is a picture of the flesh. Do you know in chapter 14, verse 14, you know what the Lord told the people when they came? Pharaoh's army was behind them, and the Red Sea was in front of them, and here was an army, just like here's an army, God didn't say, choose you out men, Joshua, and go defend yourself against Pharaoh. No, he said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And in verse 14, literally says, the Lord will fight for you. Get you a lounge chair, sit down, and observe the battle. God's going to take care of Pharaoh's army. But now he says, choose you out men. Go to battle. Pick up a sword. You're going to participate in this, Joshua. Now, do you know when God saved me, I didn't participate. I just got out of the way, and God saved me. I was rebelling. I was trying to stop him. I was trying to not allow it to take place, but I got out of the way, and I said, okay, I'm going to quit resisting, and I received the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let me tell you, the moment I was saved, that new nature moved into my heart. God gave me the ability to be able to live a, a victorious Christian life, but I've got to participate. There's got to be some participation in that. You know, there is a reason that we need spiritual discipline in our life. It's not just automatic. We don't just turn on a switch. Now I'm saved, and I'm always going to want to read my Bible. Now I'm saved, I, won't, I just can't hardly wait to go pray. Now I'm saved, and boy, sin doesn't even appeal to me anymore. Well, that isn't going to happen. You see, it takes some participation. After I'm saved, there is profit in standards in my life. I mean, it's not just a, it's not legalism. The Bible tells me in Romans chapter 6, verse 13, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness. That is, I'm not to give my member. I'm to hang on to it. I'm to participate. God provides the power, and I provide the participation. God gives me the ability to say no to sin, but I've got to help and participate along with him. Now, the Christian life is not 50% me and 50% God. It's all of God's power, but it is my stepping into 
what he has provided. I mean, obviously Israel couldn't defeat this battle. It, God didn't need their help. It wasn't that okay where well, they're so close, they're just about to beat Amalek that God will just tip them over the edge. God could have wiped out Amalek, but he didn't. He only gave them just enough of what they needed to defeat them little by little, and they prevailed. There was participation, but you know there's also power. I go back and read verse 10. It came to pass as Aaron spake unto the whole, I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong passage, chapter 17, verse 10. So Joshua did as Moses said to him, fought with Amalek. Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill, and it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Now, when God provides the power, when Moses holds up his hand, we can prevail. Galatians 5, 16, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. God provides power for victory. Thanks be unto God that giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Sin, Romans 6, 14, shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. See, the grace of God has provided me power to be able to live for Him, but in the midst of that, there is spiritual discipline. In the midst of that, I do say that there are some decrees that I ought to keep. In the midst of that, I take the Word of God and I say, God, I want to apply this in a very practical way. The Bible says in Romans 14, 13, make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Hey, God's not just going to automatically, whether I want to or not, make me live a holy life. He commands me, be ye holy, for I am holy. And the way to respond to that is I participate. God, I want to do right, and every time I go to this one place, it seems like my flesh gets control. I ought not go to that place. I mean, every time I get around these folks, it seems like they draw out the worst in me. Yes, I know you've given me power, but maybe I just need to not be around those folks. Evil communications corrupt good manners. So there's participation, there's power, but then there's the position. In verse 12, Moses' hands were heavy. They took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. His hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Now Moses, this isn't a picture of God. God never gets tired. But do you realize when God gives his power, there are influences that don't hinder God, but they do hinder me from depending on him. You see, there is a spiritual battle. We do wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. I mean, there, are, there is evil in this world, and it's not just men. There is an evil force. The devil's behind it. And as it were, the devil would try to make those hands heavy. So when Moses held up his hands, you know what he did? He sat on a rock. You know, if I want spiritual power, I've got to be founded on the rock. The rock is Jesus. The rock is the Word of God. But you know, not only do I have here his position seated on the rock, you know what else he had? He had some partners. He had Aaron and her to help hold up his hands. Now I think about this. Moses was there himself, and every time he would hold up the rod, there was victory. But man, that thing started getting heavy. He might have tried one side. Tried the other side. He might have rested it on his head a little bit. But I mean, that thing was getting hard. And so eventually they sat him down. And then he was sitting down. But he said, man, I don't think I can do it much more. Aaron took that arm. Her took that arm. And all of them together held it up. Do you know the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 that a threefold cord is not easily broken? You know, it's wonderful that God has provided me the ability to go to him and pray and fight spiritual battles. But how much more if I fight those spiritual battles with other believers with me? There's power in the believers joining together and praying for spiritual victory. You know, Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1, Brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified. You know what that tells me? That tells me Paul, and he was a powerful preacher. The power of God was on his life. 
He was utterly surrendered. Don't notice that if we've ever known a Christian since the Apostle Paul who set a great example of what God could do with one man who was totally dedicated to him, I don't think we would point out to Paul and say, well, Paul, if you were spiritual enough, we wouldn't have to pray for you. If you were right with God, we would, you wouldn't have to ask us. I mean, the point is, Paul said, brethren, pray for us that the word of God may have free course. That tells me that if they didn't pray, Paul could pray all he wanted to. He wasn't going to see the same spiritual success as if others prayed for him too. Now, that first of all tells me that I'm not myself sufficient to make it spiritually without your help. I need your prayer. I also don't believe you're going to make it spiritually if I don't pray for you. You know, I'm glad that we've got live stream. I'm glad that we can watch the service. But live stream is no substitute for church. You imagine if we did this every Sunday, you say, well, I watched some preaching. I was encouraged. And I, you know, was there and I listened to maybe we had some singing and so forth. Isn't that the same thing? You know, that's the supplement. We come to gather around the Word of God. We come to be encouraged by the Word of God. But being with one another, I, I can't pray. As a pastor, I may do more of this than you. But as a church member, you don't necessarily pray for every single church member every week. But maybe just that person you ran into on Sunday, God puts them on your heart and mind, and you pray for that person. You don't know what struggles they're going through or difficulty. Or maybe both of you get to talking, and you think, boy, we've got a real problem we're facing. Let's pray about this thing together. And Jesus said, where two of you are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. If two of you shall agree on anything touching as touching anything, that it shall be done. It, it is, there is significance in us holding up each other in prayer. I don't know there's anything that a praying church couldn't see God do if we're really praying. Now, we wouldn't pray for something God wasn't in because if we're a praying church, we're going to be a discerning church. You know, wouldn't it be something if God was to bring himself glory in the midst of this virus and epidemic, what if it turned out that not nearly as many people died as they said were going to die? I mean, they're putting some big numbers up there, and they might. We don't know. There is evil in the world. I mean, disease takes place. Who knows? But wouldn't it be something that that number was way low and it came as a result of God's people asking for deliverance? Wouldn't it be a blessing if somebody stopped and scratched their head and said, wonder why that disease didn't spread? Not because, well, Tri-City Baptist Church must have prayed. Not because, boy, that powerful Christian must have prayed or some big-name televangelist must have said something. If all of those people were insignificant, but if even the lost world said, I just believe God must have done it. Now, God wants to be glorified. You know, Jesus said, whatever you shall ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. There's just no telling what God might do if we discern His will and we pray. Now, I can't tell you what his will is. God allows things to take place, even in the midst of this situation. But I'll tell you this, we ought to pray for one another. We don't know what kind of things we're struggling with, and I know I need your prayer. You need all our prayer. We need Aaron and her, as it were, to hold up the arms of the power of God that we might see victory over the flesh. And God is able to give it. I'm going to close there tonight with the study, and I'm going to have another word of prayer. And I've had a couple of people, and I certainly uh, agree with the sentiment, and different people have different applications. Um, we do need to pray as a church, and I think all of us probably already are praying about this. I know I've prayed about this situation with the, with the virus, and uh, we do want God to receive glory in it. And so I don't know as a church exactly how we need to approach it, uh, perhaps as we uh, continue in this, uh, we may approach it in an organized way. Maybe we'll put out a prayer uh, chain or perhaps we'll have a special prayer meeting. We could have a virtual prayer meeting if we wanted to. Uh, even though we don't have to be together, sometimes if we pray and we're praying together, sometimes that's a, a possibility. But in the meantime, as a church, let's pray. And let's pray not for just relief, but let's pray for God to be glorified. 
I mean, what if there's some folks that get saved that wouldn't have got saved any other way? What if we, in May, had a service and packed this place out with folks who'd never been to church because they're searching? I don't know what God might do, but I know whatever he does will be right, and I know he wants to do it for his glory. So as we close tonight, I'm going to close in prayer for our church and prayer for this situation and just ask God to give us wisdom as we navigate it, and then that will close our service. So let's have prayer. Lord, we do pray tonight that you would put your hand on our church. We're not able to meet as we'd like. Uh, we're trying to use some innovative ways to just to be able to encourage one another. We do pray especially uh, tonight for, I don't know, five or six of our families that have no ability to be able to go online. And then some even tonight maybe don't have the, uh, the, the place to accomplish it, maybe can watch it on Sunday. But, Lord, we just pray that you would encourage them. Lord, in the midst of this, would you give us opportunities to uh, share the gospel, even though we're separated from folks, maybe with neighbors or whoever it might be. And then, Lord, we pray that you'd protect us from the virus itself, that, Lord, you would protect us from sickness, if that could be your will. It's not always your will, but if we were to get it, that you'd keep us from uh, getting sick. We just pray you'd put your hand of protection on us. But ultimately, Lord, we pray you'd wipe it out. Lord, I'm not too uh, insecure in your power to ask that even tomorrow you'd wipe it out that even tomorrow there would be a, uh, a newscast that they just can't see any new cases and that uh, people are getting well. I don't know what you would want to do, but you're able to do it. So, Lord, would you tonight, in a very definite way, burden us individually to pray, to seek your face, to ask you to work, and that not only in this, but ultimately that you might receive glory in all of our lives. And we thank you for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.